Well, hi again, FBC. I am so glad that we can be together, and it's really fun for me to be back in the sanctuary. Uh, actually, it's a little weird for me to be back in the sanctuary. Uh, there are actually um, two human beings here, so I'm not just talking by myself in my office at home, so I'm kind of nervous. Um, we'll see how this goes, but, uh, but it is fun because this is in anticipation of us reopening again soon, and um, as I think Slade mentioned, we are looking at reopening uh, even this next Sunday. So please, please stay tuned for more details. We are just making absolutely sure that when we reopen, we can reopen with, um, uh, with the ability to say that you are safe and, um, and to be hospitable and loving in that way. And so we are looking forward to that. Um, well, I, I was thinking about this passage in this sermon that we're going to be looking at today. It's uh, Romans 7, verses 1 through 6. And, you know, there are a lot of times, well, every time I write a sermon, what it, I, I always try to do is to sit down and really think through, how does this apply to me? Before I ever take it out to how does this apply to the congregation, I want to know what is the Holy Spirit doing in my life through this passage? Well, today's passage is one of those passages where... Um, it's really okay if you just fall asleep because this was all about me. Uh, the Holy Spirit just really, really worked in my life through this passage because anyone who knows me will know how deeply I struggle with the issues in this passage. Um, specifically, what I struggle with is I struggle with a performance system. I struggle with having to perform well enough so that I'm not condemned by God. And um, there was a time in my life, in fact, that if you want all the gory details, talk to Anne. But I would wake up almost every night, in the middle of the night, uh, upset and extremely anxious over the fact that, uh, from God's perspective, I was wasting my life. Uh, I was very, very anxious that if I were to see God face to face in that moment, he would not say to me, well done, good and faithful servant. He would say to me, why have you wasted everything that I have given to you? All of our struggles are a little bit different, but here's what I want to suggest. I think there is something in that story that probably connects with everyone. There's something in that struggle and it may not be over that particular issue, but I think if we are really honest with ourselves, all of us struggle with the idea of, does God look at me and say, boy, what a disappointment? Does God look at me and condemn me because of my performance? And we see that in different ways in people's lives. Just since quarantine has started, I, I've had some extended conversation with someone who is weighed down heavily by shame over sin that she committed 20 years ago or more. Just had conversation with someone where you, you look them in the eye and, and you see the struggle to admit that they are wrong, that they have done anything wrong, that they have sinned, that, that they have made a mistake, and, and what is behind that is as you look at the person, you just know that they are so afraid that if they truly have to come face to face with the fact that, that they are wrong or they didn't perform well, they can't handle the weight of the condemnation that they would feel. Well, as we move into Romans chapter 7 this morning, this is the very issue that Paul is going to take us to and he is going to address. But before we get into that, I want us to reset uh, with the book of Romans and where we are and what is going on in the book of Romans. We're going to take a little more time to do that this morning and look at it from a couple of different perspectives because today's passage is a shorter passage and I think this is a good opportunity for us to do that. Well, there's a main message in the book of Romans, and it is summarized in two verses in chapter 1. It's verses 16 and 17. Let me remind you of what those verses are. For I am not ashamed of the gospel, for it is the power of God for salvation to everyone who believes, to the Jew first and also to the Greek. For in it, the righteousness of God is revealed from faith to faith, 
as it is written, the righteous shall live by faith. In fact, the title of this series, Live by Faith, is taken from this passage. And, and as we see, the book is structured to, to kind of tease out that theme through the very structure of the book. And we've seen this chart a lot, but, but just to remind us, the first 11 chapters of the book of Romans are all about the fact that God gives righteousness. That's the good news of the gospel that has the power of salvation that Paul talked about in chapter 1, verses 16 and 17. The last part of the book, uh, verses 12 through 15, are all about the righteous living by faith. And we have been going through that first part, and, and we saw in the first three chapters, actually first two and a half chapters, that Paul establishes why it is that we need righteousness, and it is because no one can stand before God and say, I am good enough for you. That is absolutely impossible. And then Paul goes on in the next section to define what righteousness is. Righteousness is that declaration that we are restored with God, that we, are, that we are pure in the sight of God. And it is possible only through the perfect life that Jesus lived, his death on the cross, and his resurrection. And we've now transitioned into the third major section of that first part, the first 11 chapters, and that is how righteousness affects us. And if you remember, we have seen so far in chapter 6 that we are free from the control of sin. And in the first part of chapter six, we saw it's because of, of who we are in Christ. And then last week, Slade took us through the second part of chapter six, and it showed us it's because of whose we are. We belong to Christ. We are, we are his, and because of that, we are freed from the power of sin. But the reality is that we continue to sin. And so that is going to be the theme that Paul picks up in verse 7, before we, or chapter 7. But before we get there, I want to look one different way at what we have been saying in the book of Romans. And this is the perspective of what does Romans say about you? Well, one way to think about it is Paul starts by talking about who you were without Christ who you were before you accepted Christ and became a follower of Christ. And we see that really in the first three chapters. And, and the moral condition that characterized us as we were unrighteous, we did not live up to the standard that God has applied, the, the standard of a perfect and holy God. And because of that, our relationship with God was characterized by being under wrath. And we had no hope because of that. In fact, our, our very lives proved our own guilt before God. And one of the things that we saw is that if we had ever come face to face with the holy God in that condition, we would agree wholeheartedly with him that we are condemned and we deserve that condemnation. We saw that there are no free passes and no excuses. There's nothing that, that is going to excuse us from that situation. And finally, we saw that there is no escape from sin. Without Christ, there is nothing we can do about our situation. Well, Paul continues in Romans, and, and then what he says about us is that the gospel, the Lord stepped in because we could do nothing about our own situation, and he made a provision for us through Christ, and that provision was the perfect life of Jesus, his death on the cross, which took on all the wrath for our sins, and his resurrection, which made possible new life. And we receive that, we respond to that in faith, and as we do respond to that in faith, the righteousness of Christ becomes our righteousness. And so now we're in the section where Paul is going to talk about what is true of us now. And what is true of us now is, is whereas our moral condition had been unrighteous, we are now declared righteous by God. Even though we still sin, God looks at us and he sees the righteousness of Christ. Our relationship with God it used to be under wrath, but now it's characterized by peace, and we are reconciled to God. In fact, we saw in chapter 6 that we are united with Christ in his death, and we are united with Christ in his resurrection. And that point is really foundational to what we're going to see in today's passage. We are united with Christ in his death, and we are united with him in his resurrection. 
And so where we used to have no hope, now we have a hope that is absolutely guaranteed, that is assured, because it is based on God justifying us, declaring us righteous. It is because of his free gift of grace that all we have to do is receive. And now again, as we saw in chapter 6, we are freed from the power of sin. Whereas we used to not have the capacity to say no to sin, now we have that capacity. But again, the reality is that we continue to sin. So what happens to us? Does this mean that, that we just step back into, into being condemned as we continue to struggle with sin? And the incredible message of Romans 7 is no. We are freed from that threat of condemnation. And so let's dive into Romans chapter 7 and give you just a quick overview of what you're going to see. Paul is going to introduce a principle and then he's going to illustrate that principle uh, with the illustration of marriage. And we'll see that in the first three verses. And then in the last three verses that we'll look at today, we are going to see Paul apply that principle to our lives. So we start with the principle, and that is that death frees us from the law. Romans 7, 1 through 3 says, Or do you not know, brothers, for I'm speaking to those who know the law, that the law is binding on a person only as long as he lives? For a married woman is bound by law to her husband while he lives, but if her husband dies, she is released from the law of marriage. Accordingly, she will be called an adulteress if she lives with another man while her husband is alive. But if her husband died, dies, she is free from that law. And if she marries another man, she is not an adulteress. Well, the principle that Paul lays out here is laid out in, in verse 1, and it's this principle right here that the law is binding on a person only as long as he lives. Now, that seems so obvious to us, it's just bizarre that Paul would say it, right? How many times have you ever seen a policeman give someone dead a ticket? It just doesn't happen. Of course, the law doesn't apply to dead people. But Paul's making a point here. And so to tease that out, he starts illustrating it in, in uh, verse 2. And he looks at marriage, and he, he talks about first the status under the law of this person. For a married woman is bound by, bound by law to her husband while she lives. So if she's under the law, her, or she's married, she is bound by the law that governs marriage as long as she and her husband are alive. But if her husband dies, her status changes. She's released from the law. She's no longer under the authority of the law. And so then in chapter 3, what Paul gives us is the consequence, or to be more specific, the condemnation that is faced under the law. So in verse 3, if she is under the law and she violates the law, she'll be called an adulteress if she lives with another man. But what if her status has changed and she's no longer under the law? If her husband has died, she's free from the law. And so now she can do that exact same thing. She can, she can marry another man, and she's no longer condemned by the law. So Paul's point is, while she's under the law, she is condemned. But death frees her from being under the law. Now, I just want to say a quick aside here. Um, if you have studied this passage or uh, read about this passage it's really easy for people to just go crazy on this illustration. And people will try to think, well, the, the wife symbolizes this, and the, humble, the husband symbolizes that, and, and they will get really convoluted. Look, Paul's point here is just really simple. Death changes the status of your relationship with the law, and because of that, it changes the consequences of your relationship in the law. If you're under the law... You're held accountable and condemned by the law. If you are, but if death comes into play, that changes everything. Again, that seems weird, but Paul is trying to make a point. And what Paul is going to do is he is going to illustrate for us or apply for us this principle that the law, that death changes our relationship with the law. And the other thing he's going to do is he's actually going to take uh, one aspect of his illustration and he's going to pick that up as well as he goes into verses 4 through 6. 
But before we go there, I want to just stop for a second and talk about the law. When we talk about the law, Paul is talking about the law of Moses, right? The, the Old Testament. And, and the way that worked is, is there, were, there were laws, rules in the Old Testament. We think of the Ten Commandments as being certainly uh, the most famous example of that. And the idea was you needed to keep those Ten Commandments in order to be accepted by God, to be in a right relationship with God. And, and the reality was that it was impossible to keep the law. And so the Lord made a provision for that in the sacrificial system. And, and we think about all of that, and that just seems so foreign to us. We think, you know, just, it just doesn't apply. How does this even make sense in our lives? But I want to argue that it's actually incredibly relevant to what we experience every single day, even as Christians. Because you see, here's the underlying assumption beneath that whole law system. And the underlying assumption is that righteousness is based on your performance. Righteousness is based on what you do and what you don't do. And if you fail to do what the law requires, or if you don't do what the law, re- if you don't do what the law requires, or do what the law forbids, then you are held accountable as someone who is unrighteous. You see, that sort of thinking, that righteousness or unrighteousness is based totally on what you do or don't do, is exactly what was behind my fear, my anxiety every night that I woke up. And I feared that God would look at me and say, you are a failure. It is what is behind the person who is carrying 20 years of shame and guilt over sin that was done but has been forgiven. It is what is behind that person who cannot come to grips with the fact that they too are fallen and they too sin and wound people around them. And they do not have all of the right answers. You see, what we are released from in these first three verses is not just these specific rules in the Old Testament. It's an entire approach to righteousness. It's an entire way of thinking about what allows us to be in right relationship with God. And it's not about our performance. It's about the performance of Christ. Well, in verses 4 through 6, Paul is going to apply that principle that death frees us from the law, from the condemnation of the law, from the authority of the law. And he's going to apply it by saying that we are freed for fruitfulness, a different type of fruitfulness than we have ever encountered. Verses 4 through 6 say, Likewise, my brothers, you also have died to the law through the body of Christ, so that you may belong to one another, to him who has been raised from the dead, in order that we may bear fruit for God. For while we are living in the flesh, our sinful passions aroused by the law were at work in our members to bear fruit for death. But now we are released from the law, having died to that which held us captive, so that we serve in the new way of the Spirit and not in the old way of the written code, which is another way of saying the law. So here's the idea in verse 4. You have died to the law through the body of Christ. What is he talking about there? He's going back to the beginning of chapter 6, where he said in chapter 6, you are united with Christ in his death. And so there's a very real sense that when Christ died, when we become a follower of Christ, we were truly present. We died with him in a very, very real sense. And Paul is basically saying, don't you know that you have experienced death through the death of Christ? What's the result of that? The result of that or the purpose of that is that you may belong to another. Who's that other? It's to Christ who has been raised from the dead. Why? Why have we gone through that? In order that we may bear fruit for God. Well, what does that mean, bear fruit for God? That's an odd statement. Well, if you were with us last week, what Paul is doing is he's actually pointing back to something that was at the very end of the passage that Slade took us through last week. See, it says in Romans 6.22, 
But now that you have been set free from sin and have become slaves of God, the fruit that you get leads to sanctification and its end, its ultimate result is eternal life. You see, the fruit that Paul is talking about is sanctification. It, and sanctification means our spiritual growth. It's, it's that process over a lifetime of becoming more like Christ, of thinking like Christ thinks, of, of loving what Christ loves and valuing what he values, of relating to people the way Christ relates to people, and of having the purposes that Christ has. And that's a lifelong process. And, and Paul is saying that is the fruit that gets developed in our lives. So we go back to, to verse 4 of chapter 7, and we see what Paul is saying here is that through the death of Christ, the law no longer can condemn us. And instead, the result is that we will grow spiritually. 5 and 6 then talk about how we live and serve in a whole new way because of this. And, and verse 5 is looking back to before we were a Christian. That's what it means by uh, living in the flesh. And what it's saying is that our, our sinful passions were aroused by the law. And this word passions is, is the idea of, of impulses, of, of um, what directs us. And it's, it's saying that when the law comes, what that did is it aroused those sinful passions. If you have ever been... 10 years old, you know exactly what this is talking about. If you have ever walked into a room or a building where there is a sign that says, do not touch wet paint, you know exactly what this is talking about. Because the second we see that sign, there is something that rises up inside of our 10-year-old selves that make us go, boop. And we just have to touch and see if that paint really is wet. There's another really great example of that that I love from, um, from the history of the church. One of the most influential early Christians was a man named Augustine, and he actually wrote his, uh, an entire book about his testimony. And one of the stories that he shares in there, uh, before he was a Christian, is, is that he lived next door to someone who had a fruit tree. I think it was a pear tree. And, of course, he was not allowed to enter into that person's yard and get that pear tree. That was forbidden him. Well, Augustine didn't even like pears. So what does he do? The first chance he gets, he breaks into that yard and steals a bunch of pears. Why? He doesn't like pears. It's because some, someone told him not to. That's the idea. We can relate to that impulse. Paul is saying, when, when you see the, the sign that says, do not touch, what arises inside of us naturally is that desire to break that rule. And it says here that, that those sinful passions were at work in our members. That's every part of who we are, our mind, our emotions, our passions, our body, our, our spirit, all of us, to bear fruit for death. If fruit for God was a life that is growing spiritually and becoming more like Christ, fruit for death is just the opposite. It is a life that is in disobedience and rebellion, that it's turning its back on God and becoming less and less like the character of Christ. Verse 6 takes us to present state. That's who we were, but that's not who we are now. But now we are released from the law, having died to that which held us captive. Why? What's the result? So that we may serve, we may live in a new way, a way of the Spirit, and not in the old way, the way of the written law. You see, our current condition is that we live and serve in a whole new way. The law no longer drives us. It no longer condemns us. We live, we serve in the new way of the Holy Spirit. So I was working through this passage, uh, I, I created this chart because it really helped me put together what it is that Paul is saying. What is the difference between the life that is under the law versus the life that is lived in the new way of the Spirit? And so I hope this is helpful for you. And the first thing is, what is the basis of our righteousness? Well, under the law, the basis of our righteousness, of my righteousness, is my performance. It's how well I do. My assignment is to keep the rules, whatever those rules are. And my motivation is, is to earn God's acceptance. 
the power that I have to, to, to accomplish my assignment is based completely on my own effort. And the fruit of that is a life of disobedience leading to condemnation. I want to say one of the things that is ironic about this type of, um, of a life is sometimes the standards can be really good standards. They can be things like the Ten Commandments. But very often the standards that we apply to ourselves, the rules that we have to keep or the rules that we tell other people that they have to keep are not based on Scripture at all. I had a friend in college who absolutely believed that if he received any grade in any class lower than an A, he would be condemned by God. Where did he get that standard, that, exp- that expectation? It is nowhere in Scripture. So sometimes we live under the law that we find in Scripture. Sometimes we live under the law that we impose on ourselves. But here's the worst part. Sometimes we impose that law on other people. And we set standards on them that lead us to look down on them and to condemn them. That is life under the law. But life in the new way of the Spirit looks radically different in our motives and what's going on inside of us, even if outside it looks very similar. What is our righteousness based on? Our righteousness is based not on my performance, but on Jesus' performance. Jesus lived a perfectly righteous life, and when when I become his follower, what happens is God gives me credit. He looks at me and sees the righteousness of Christ. God declares us righteous, even as our lives continue to struggle with sin. He says, when I see you, I see the righteousness of Christ. What is our assignment? Our assignment is to be like Jesus. Jesus, we are to be his followers. That's what the word disciple means. It is someone who is living out the intention of becoming more like Christ. And here's what's fascinating. Keeping the rules and being like Jesus on the outside can look very, very similar, if not identical. But what's different is where the motivation is and what we look to as our power. The motivation and the new way of the Spirit is is the fact that we have already received God's acceptance. We're not trying to go earn it. We live out of gratitude and love and thankfulness for the fact that we have received the acceptance of God, and that's what's motivating us. We're not trying to earn it. We have it. What powers what empowers us is not just my effort and trying harder and working harder, but it is the Holy Spirit at work within me. And the fruit of that is spiritual growth. It's more and more living out the righteousness that God declares that I have. And the end result is eternal life. And remember in Scripture, eternal life is not just life in heaven. It is life with God that starts now and that we get to experience fully and most gloriously in heaven. That is the result. And so here's the really hard question or hard questions that I want to ask you as we wrap up looking at this passage. When you look at this chart, which of these approaches to life, approaches to the Christian faith, is influencing you? See, when you think about what are the the books that you read, the podcasts that you listen to, the sermons that you hear, the classes that you attend, what are they telling you that the Christian life is? There are so many sermons, so many classes, and so many books that will tell you, here are the three things that you must work hard to do, grit your teeth, and God will reward you with a happy marriage. What they just gave you was life under the law. Those three things might be really good, but the way a sermon or a lesson or a book is going to say that if they're operating from the approach of a new way of the Spirit, is to say these three things reflect the character of Christ and help your spouse reflect the character of Christ. And you as a fallen sinful person cannot do those perfectly and effectively and in the way that you need to, so you fall on your knees before God and you ask for His help. And then you do the best you can 
knowing that even as you fail, God forgives you, he loves you, and he works through you. See, those are very different approaches to the Christian life. So which, which type of thinking are you allowing to influence you? Here's another question. Which approach to life are you actually living? When, you, when, when, I, was, when I was waking up at midnight so stressed that if God looked at me, he would say, you're a failure. What a disappointment you are. I'll let you into heaven, but I'm letting you into heaven disappointed in what you are. I was living out a life under the law, thinking that everything was about my performance, that my righteousness, my acceptance before God was all about my performance. Is that what you think? Or do you say to yourself, yeah, there's so many things where I, I need to grow, so many sins that I struggle with. But when God looks at me, he sees the righteousness of Christ. And a really good sign of how much that is true of how you see yourself is by looking at how you relate to others. I'm going to challenge you. Go back and look at your posts on Facebook. What do they say about which approach to life you take? If a non-Christian were to read your posts on Facebook, what would that non-Christian think that the Christian life is all about? Would they think it's about life under the law, or they think it's about a new way of the Spirit? How can you tell? Well, how often do you condemn others because they don't meet your standard? I have been grieved as I read so many posts on Facebook from all over the country. I'm, I'm not just talking about FBC. I'm talking about people everywhere where people are, are cruel and condescending and condemning to people who disagree with them on the right steps and the right timing for reopening this country. The fact is there are legitimate differences of opinions. And the fact is, what God calls us to is to recognize that my standard and my perspective is not something that I have to impose on other people and then look down on them if they don't meet it. What I do is respond to them the same way that Christ responds to me, with love, forgiveness, patience, and understanding. And that doesn't mean that we can't disagree. We should disagree over things, and we should sharpen one another in our thinking. But how we do that is either going to, either going to reflect a life under the law or a new way of the Spirit. And so my challenge to you is to go back and, and take a look. What is it that you're actually reflecting? Does your tone suggest that you're condemning someone? You're condescending towards someone? You think someone's just ignorant, someone is stupid, someone is stubborn, or does it suggest that you really can extend acceptance, love, and grace just as you receive from Christ? That's a hard challenge, and the fact is that we all live under a weight of condemnation because all of us cling to the belief that our righteousness at some level is about our performance. We believe that if we are not good enough, we are condemned, and we carry that belief into how we treat other people, and we place them under the exact same burden that we carry, and that weighs us down. But what Paul does in Romans 7 is tell, it's tell us that because we died with Christ, because we are united with him in his death, we no longer carry the burden of having to be good enough for God. Jesus was good enough on our behalf. So here's the point of the passage. You are free from the condemning power of performance. And the implication for that for our lives is to stop condemning yourself and condemning others for failure of performance. Do I still condemn myself? Yes, I, I don't wake up at midnight anymore. The Lord has made tremendous progress in my life. But the Lord has made progress in my life 
because I've had to confront the truth that I was living under the law and not in the new way of the Spirit. I had to hear the truth from God's Word. I had to hear the truth from my wife and from other people in my life who would say to me, you are living under the law and not under the new life of the Spirit. And I had to internalize the truth. I had to go before the Lord in prayer and ask the Holy Spirit, would you drive this truth deeper into me so that it becomes my automatic response when I'm likely to condemn myself? I needed to speak the truth to myself. I needed to hear the truth from others and from God's word. And I needed to internalize that truth through the power of the Holy Spirit. And I would suggest that's what each one of us need as well. And here are some very practical ways we can take movement in that area. Again, each week I'm challenging you to rewrite Romans. Rewrite Romans, and this week it's a shorter passage. I encourage you to rewrite Romans seven one through six. Why do we do that? Because that's one of the ways that you speak truth to yourself. You need to pray. See, the difference between a sermon that's based on the law versus a sermon that's based on the new way of the Holy Spirit is a sermon that's based on the law said, here are the things to go do, grit your teeth, leave here and go get them. And all that does is set you up for disappointment, failure, and self-condemnation. A sermon that's based on the new way of the Spirit always says, here are things to go do. Now fall on your knees before God and ask for the power of the Holy Spirit to work in you to be able to do those things. And that's why we always have to end with one of our responses being a response of prayer. Ask the Holy Spirit to release you from the fear of condemnation. And then I would ask you to do some very hard very critical self-evaluation. Where have you on Facebook, social media, personal conversations, other venues, where have you, when you honestly look at it and say, I have held up a standard and made my acceptance of that person based on their ability to perform according to that standard, whether that's performing their thinking, their political, their political views, their actions, whatever it is. And I think you need to really honestly assess where that's happened because every one of us is guilty of it. And then we need to fall before our knees, fall on our knees before the Lord and ask forgiveness. And then the really hard part is we need to go to the person that we've hurt and say, will you forgive me? Let's rebuild this relationship. We close in prayer because, as I said, the wrong message, the message of life under the law, is the message of go out and do these things, try hard, pull yourself up by your bootstraps. The right message is we fall on our knees before the Lord and say we depend on you. So let's go to the Lord together and pray and express our dependence upon the Lord. Father, we thank you that your love for us as expressed in Christ freed us from the condemning power of the law, freed us from the condemnation of of having to base our righteousness, our acceptance by you on our performance. And Lord, we confess that we are guilty of slipping into that mindset. We are guilty of still still thinking that, the, that it is up to us and our efforts and our performance to be good enough for you and to fix our own lives. And Lord, that is just a form of idolatry. And we confess it to you. But even in our confession, we are reminded this morning of the truth that you look at us and you see the righteousness of Christ. You have freed us from the condemning power of living up to uh, certain expectations in order to earn your acceptance. Lord, we thank you for that. We thank you that even in our failings and struggles, you look at us and you see Christ. And you continue to work to fix us where we struggle. 
but you see Christ. Lord, we ask that you would help us to leave this service together with the confidence of knowing that we are secure in you because we are united with Christ and we are released from the condemning power of the law. We pray this in Jesus' precious name, amen. So here's what we've said this morning about who God is. What we have said is that God has freed us from the condemning power of righteousness based on performance. So how do we respond to that in our lives? We respond to it by stopping the condemnation that we heap on ourselves and the condemnation that we heap on others. It's a hard task, and we can't do it on our own, but the Holy Spirit looks forward to doing that in your life this next week. Hopefully, we'll be seeing each other in person next Sunday, and until then, uh, know that you are loved by the Lord.